In the previous video, we took a look at the schematic. In this video, we'll dive into actually breadboarding the circuit and take a look at the various signals on the oscilloscope. So the setup at this point is we've got the 8-bit binary up count. We've got the logic pod connected for data 0 to data 7. Those are coming into the logic analyzer. The logic analyzer setup is the bus type is parallel, meaning it's looking at all 8 bits. There's various types of bus. Decoding is enabled. Configuration is just data 0 to data 7 or mapped to the bus bit 0 to bit 7. Display setup is set to display hexadecimal. Output and show the bits. I've got no label set. So what we're seeing here is I consider the frame starting at 0, 0, although it's just a binary up count. So along the bottom here, I don't know if I can zoom this more or not. Apparently not. Well, I zoomed this way. We can see the decoded hex values, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, etc. And if we scroll, we can see that it's doing a nice binary up count. We've counted up to, we'll get to 2, 0 here, hex. There's 2, 0 hex. And if we keep scrolling and keep scrolling and keep scrolling, I'll get us up to 3E hex, 40 hex. So it's a nice binary up count going on here. Let's get up to the other end of the of the full up count. And we'll stop here for a second. So of course you can see the eight data channels up here represented in the up count. And their hex decoded value. And let's just keep scrolling. And scrolling, and scrolling. At this point, we are halfway through. So, bit eight has made the transition from a zero to a one here. So, thus we have an eight zero hex. So, we are halfway through the up count. That was an up count at 128 at that point. And if we just keep scrolling along, eventually we'll get up to FF. So this is a demonstration of what part one of this little demo circuit was meant to be able to demonstrate. It's really designed to work with mostly parallel buses. So there's F, C, F, D, F, E, F, F. So at this point, all of the bits are ones, thus we have an F, F, hex, and then they all drop back to zero on the, on the next clock and we get the zero, zero hex. So there is a look at parallel bus decoding on the RTB 2004. It's based on this little circuit we described a little bit earlier. Very quickly, there's a clock generator. There are 474 74s providing eight D flip-flops doing a divide by two cascade. And it's just jumper wired over here to tap off to the probe and tap off to the displays. Uh, if we slow the clock down, We'll see this start to spread out. Anyhow, there's a quick demonstration. Uh, I'll get the next bit of hardware added here and we'll continue to build on this. Bye for now. So I was speaking with a friend about this project yesterday and we talked about the fact that I'm using eight D flip-flops here to generate the uh, binary up count and he asked the question well, why not just use an 8 or 10 bit single chip up counter and I told him the reason was that I wanted to explore propagation delay and kind of talk a little bit to it uh, in logic a propagation delay speaks to when a gate sees an input signal how long does it take before that output signal actually occurs there is a finite amount of time typically in nanoseconds uh, it's electronics. Nothing reacts in zero time. So what I'm doing here to demonstrate this is I have a 16 megahertz crystal oscillator. It's feeding the clock back up here to the first flip-flop. That flip-flop's output feeds the second flip-flop. That one feeds the third. That one feeds the fourth, etc. All the way through. And each one of the flip-flops is providing a divide by two. Uh, function. So 16 megahertz is coming in, 8 megahertz is coming out. 
that 8 megahertz goes into the next flip-flop, 4 megahertz comes out, that 4 goes into the next flip-flop, 2 comes out, that 2 goes into the next one, 1 comes out, and so on down the chain. And that's how this is producing what is in essence, well, what is here, an 8-bit binary upcount. So let's zoom into this a bit and see if we can spot the propagation delay. It would help, of course, if I looked at the right signal. Now we've got some artifacts here that are interesting. You see a couple little peaks there. That is, they're showing up in multiple places. That's probably because I'm driving these counters about as fast as they can be driven. Uh, there might be other reasons for that. Uh, it may be because I don't have any decoupling capacitors on here. Uh, the way ground is ran here is pretty piss poor. The uh, stripes in black are ground, the stripes in red are providing power. There's no decoupling. I don't know how dirty the power supply in this thing is. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that could be happening. Anyhow, what we want to look at is pretty much there on the center of the screen, is right through here. And if you even notice at, uh, what are we sampling at, 200 nanoseconds per division, you can start to see that those aren't perfectly aligned. And as we drill in, you begin to really see that, that staircase going on there. Got a bit of jitter there. I don't know if I can clean that up with a little better triggering. I can't. That jitter may just be legitimate. But let's really blow this out. So there was 10 nanoseconds per division. So what you're seeing on the top trace is the output of the first flip-flop generating that 8 megahertz signal. And that output is fed into the next flip-flop and there's a propagation delay there. We're at 10 nanoseconds per division, so that's about 5 nanoseconds propagation delay. And what that tells me is these flip-flops take about 5 nanoseconds from the time the clock input happens to the time the output can react. And of course, this second waveform is providing the clock input for the third divide by 2. And there's about that 5 nanoseconds again, and the 5 nanoseconds again, and again, as we work down the chain. So there's a great example of propagation delay in a digital circuit. This is the reason I actually built this the way it is. Uh, it's so we could go in and actually explore this and look at it a little bit. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, at least I find it interesting and I hope you do too. If we drill in a little further, we can take the scope all the way down to one nanosecond per division. And although the triggering isn't rock solid here, what we can see, let me find the orange pointer again, is from that edge where it drops to that edge where it drops is about one, two, three, four, five, six, closer to maybe seven nanoseconds there. We're of course getting some jitter where these, these edges are moving back and forth and we're actually seeing some jitter here as well. Jitter refers to exactly what you're seeing here, where the output signals aren't perfect, where the edges kind of move back and forth. Uh, lots of things can cause jitter. Uh, in a crappy little prototype like I have on the board here, there's no surprise there's jitter. So I'm going to ask a fundamental question and we'll, exp we'll explore it here. The first flip-flop in the chain it's being driven off this 16 megahertz oscillator. If I change that to say 8 or 10 megahertz, would that affect the propagation delay? I'll give you a few seconds here to think about it and I'm going to pause the video while I change that oscillator out and I'll be back. So I've gone ahead and dug through my parts bin and I found a 4.9152 megahertz crystal so it's a little less than or a little less than four times slower we had a 16 megahertz in there before this is 4.9 almost 5 megahertz the question I asked was will this affect the propagation delay let's go ahead and take a look so we are five nanoseconds per division we're looking at that same stage divide by two four six or divide by two four eight sixteen thirty two 
and you can see it's about the same it's still about five nanoseconds per division in a relatively low speed circuit like this you know it's not going to make a difference this is truly the time it takes the circuit inside of that IC to react from an input to an output in this case I'll say it again the input being uh, a square wave feeding in and that square wave getting divided by two uh, we can see we've got lots of really wonderful jitter going on there whether that's triggering or actually noise in the circuit really doesn't matter at this point you know we can pop the triggering level up and down so hopefully you found this interesting and and hopefully uh, you understand a little bit about propagation delay and the fact and I'm just going to say it again in case there's confusion. Eight total flip-flops in a chain here, two per IC. This one divides by two and sends its output to the next one that divides by two and sends its output to the next one divides by two and sends its output to the next one. And that's what you're seeing here. These are triggering on the negative going edge. There's the output going into the next one. It takes a finite amount of time to react. Trigger on the negative edge again, finite amount of time. And you get this nice staircase completely driven by the propagation delay inside of the ICs. Now, I'm just going to throw this out as a thought experiment. We get into modern computers where there's gigahertz processors and there's super, super high-speed RAM. Uh, you know, orders of magnitude faster than what we're seeing here. Where this kind of stuff becomes really, really important. Uh, wires have propagation delay it takes a finite amount of time for a signal to pass from one end of a wire to the other the same thing is true for traces on a printed circuit board it takes a certain amount of time for that signal to make it from one end of that trace to the other next time you've got a motherboard a case open you're looking at a motherboard on a modern PC computer take a look around the processor and the memory where the traces are on the printed circuit board and you'll find these really interesting patterns where the rather than being in somewhat straight lines there's curves and swirls and all of these weird little patterns when you look what those patterns are doing is making what is essentially a parallel bus like I've got represented here making the length of all of those individual traces on the printed circuit board the same and that way the signals that come in on the outputs of one chip on the end of those wires arrive at the other end of the wires at the same time. It's keeping those trace leads and the impedance and all the things that matter here the same. Uh, I find it's interesting stuff. I hope that uh, the demonstration here also gives you an idea of why having a logic analyzer can be a really nice thing. Uh, so far, there's a review with the Royden Schwartz, Roden Schwartz uh, logic analyzer. I'm very impressed. It's certainly fitting my needs. In a previous video, we looked at a bit about parallel bus decoding and looking at the hex values uh, that the data on the bus represents. Uh, the next little thought experiment is, if I can't tolerate this, how can I clean this up? What can I do? We're going to address that later in the circuit build. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this little video. I hope you found something here that was uh, instructional and interesting. And we'll talk soon. Bye. So another observation about propagation delay, uh, which might be mildly interesting. Uh, originally we were driving the circuit with 16 megahertz. We took it down to 5. Uh, I just for giggles and grins dropped a 64 megahertz crystal oscillator into the circuit just to see what would happen I have no expectations that this jelly bean TTL logic uh, can work that fast and actually with five nanosecond propagation delay you can kind of work out whatever the maximum frequency of these would be I've not looked at the data sheet these are probably a mix of very old parts and maybe a bit of newer old stock uh, so I haven't gone to the data sheet to really see, but one of the things I expected when I dropped the 65 megahertz crystal in is the circuit to just not operate at all. I had to actually thought it through. Instead, we're seeing pretty much the same waveform we saw before. Fair amount of jitter. What I believe is happening here, and of course somebody will probably correct me, is the propagation delay in these gates is limiting 
pretty much the speed the circuit can run. At least that's my guess. Because uh, we're seeing about 5 nanoseconds offset as the clocks work their way through the system. We see there might actually be a little slower flip-flop here. That's a little longer than the rest. I'm going to have to do some research and think about this, but my kind of gut feeling is, is the propagation delay time through these flip-flops is limiting. Obviously, it's going to limit the maximum speed the circuit can run. The fact that it's working cleanly actually makes sense. Uh, I think I'm going to go in and add one more trace and look at the actual incoming clock to see what it looks like that would answer this. I'll be back. Okay, I find this interesting. I live and learn. Hopefully you're learning along with me. I've gone ahead and used the channel 1 on the scope, basically tapping off that 65 megahertz signal. I've got it superimposed on the screen in the yellow tray so you can see the nice uh, out signal it's outputting. We can actually see the frequency down here. Actually, if we look at the mean, 63.46 megahertz, which is correct. We can see where the trailing edge, let me see if I can find a little better pointer here. It might show up on camera. You can see where the trailing edge of the clock is. And with the divide by two, that trailing edge toggles the output of the first divider stage high, the next trailing edge takes it low. So there's your divide by two in action. Two cycles given one output. Uh, you know, divide by two output. Sorry, I'm holding the camera crooked and you can see that across the chain there. So, I lied to you a few seconds ago in the previous video. This looks like this circuit is actually basically capable of being driven at 65 megahertz. Again, like I said, I haven't looked at the data sheet. I don't know the maximum speed of these it looks like it's probably greater than 65 megahertz. Uh, I don't know that I'm actually going to go look it up. I might. But it's interesting to see the actual input clock there in yellow, superimposed. Uh, it's interesting to see how cleanly the... Uh, Digital signals appear. Of course, it's a logic analyzer. It's looking for a threshold above and below, and it's cleaning that up for us, uh, turning it into what look like square waves. Uh, anyhow, I've been proven wrong. So apologies for the glare on the screen. I'm actually sitting outside, enjoying this nice spring day. So I want to talk quick about the uh, patterns I've chosen to program the EEPROM for our little project here, actually using a flash memory. Because I'm using an 8-bit up counter, uh, the ROM is thus being partitioned into blocks of 256 bytes. So I've gone ahead and found some patterns to program in. This first block here is a sine wave. I simply searched for 8-bit sine wave a hexadecimal on the internet and came up with that. We have a block of text here that just says Roden Schwartz over and over and over. We have another block of text here that says Shadowtron.blog over and over and over. We have what will be kind of a staircase, uh, maybe triangle wave kind of pattern. We have a couple of other blocks of long text here. We have another, another kind of a staircase uh, generator, probably be pretty similar to the other. And then I have a block, I just searched for random hexadecimal uh, character generator and generated a 256 byte random hexadecimal string. These are being stored in the TI format. I find it the easiest to hand edit. It's simply the address you want the block to start at, starts with an at sign. The hexadecimal bytes, 16 bytes per line, 16 deep is 256. And block 0, 0100, 0, 0200. And at the end of the file, you have a little queue down here, which just says that's the end of the file. The file's been saved. I've got a 
Wellon VP390 programmer. I've had a, several of these USB programmers. This one actually works really well. This one will do uh, gals and that kind of stuff, which is why I bought it. Come back over here. I have the Wellon software loaded. It's attached to the programmer. We can go ahead and load that patterns.txt file we just looked at. And here's the key parts. I mentioned it was encoded in the TI formatting. We're going to tell, just go ahead and load it as a Texas, the Texas Instruments formatting. We're going to set all of the undefined bytes to FF, just set them to clear. We're going to start loading at address 0. And we can go ahead and load that pattern. If we edit that pattern, you'll see it loaded here. We see that sine wave lookup table. We see the Roden Schwartz text. We see the Xiaotron.com text. We see those kind of uh, ramp triangle wave generators. We have this block of text that occupies two blocks. Another kind of ramp pattern generator. And then we have the block of uh, random bytes. So I'll go ahead and place the flash memory into the socket. It's a AMD 29F. 010. I've gone ahead and pre-selected the AMD AM29F010 memory type. Uh, I'll erase it just to erase it. Why not? It'll sit here. It says erase fail. That's interesting. Uh, hmm. I just programmed this a minute ago and it was fine. Anyhow, let's go ahead and program it and see if we can get it to actually program. The chip is protected. The programmer can't provide its unprotect method. I keep seeing that, uh, but when I verify now, the verify is okay. If I go in and Let's go ahead and edit the buffer. Let's fill it with all Fs. And let's go ahead and read the ROM back. And then we edit the buffer. We'll see that the pattern's actually there in the ROM. So I'm not sure why we're getting these pro protected device errors, etc., because I am able to ultimately program and erase that flash memory. So I'm kind of ignoring these messages. Anyhow, just a quick video. I've got that flash memory chip all programmed up. Next piece will be to take it in, add it to the circuit, and take a look at the outputs on it. Do some decoding. Anyhow, talk to you soon. So I thought I'd take a look at pattern triggering. So what we've got to in the evolution of our little circuit is this. I'm actually feeding the clock off a relatively low speed clock over here. It's about 10 kilohertz, I believe. Uh, I could actually measure it, I guess. Uh, we've got our divider chain, as we explained before. The 8-bit up counter is being fed to a 29F010 flash ROM. The data out of the flash ROM is being fed over to the LEDs and off to the logic analyzer course through the pod and back into the logic analyzer. The bank select that I talked about briefly before, so I've got eight banks of 256 bytes in the flash memory. These three switches here drive which bank is selected. Currently bank one is enabled, 001, so bank one is enabled. In bank one is the ASCII text Roden Schwartz. If we come over here to the capture, we can see that I've captured Roden Schwartz there in the uh, ASCII decode text along the bottom. How I did this uh, came down to editing the pattern type. We are, let me actually get something a little better to point with here and my big old finger. For the pattern triggering, we are using D0 through D7 to trigger. 
the bit pattern from D0 up is low, high, low, low, high, low, high, low, or 52 hex. When it sees that pattern, it'll do a single trigger. It'll do a single trigger because I've got single set. We just did a single trigger again. Single trigger again. Uh, let me confirm something quick over here on the laptop. The 52 hex, I don't know if this will come through on the camera. This block right here is where it says road and shorts. 52 hex is capital R. You can see the capital R here. So it triggered the first time it saw the capital R. It captured the data stream and it's now holding it static and displaying it. So because this was a single trigger event, you probably can't read that, but it says single there. It did a single trigger, captured the data stream. And uh, if we go into protocol and look at decode, we are decoding off bus one. Bus one is data zero to data seven. Decode is enabled. The configuration for the decode is, again, the eight bits to decode from. It's bit zero is data zero to data seven. If we look at the display setup up here, I've got the display type set to ASCII. So it takes what's coming in on D0 to D7. Again, D0 to D7, we'll walk the chain here. D0 to D7 is the data outputs of the flash memory. They're teed off here simply to go to these display LEDs, these little eight logic probes. Then they come down to the pod, into the scope, decoded on the scope, and we can see the ASCII text, Rode and Schwartz, displayed right there. So, that's all fine and dandy and interesting. Earlier we had looked at, see if we can zoom in and find some of it. See if I can find some interesting transitions here. Where it's clock heavy, say in there. Let's go in, see we're at two microseconds per division here. Let's get in here and start to look at those edges in higher and higher detail. and drag it down off of what's happening. So down here, let me point this out again. We've got the decoded string here where you can see the O and the H. This little block up here represents uh, data 0 to data 7. So you can see them and I've got data 0 to data 7. Kind of expanded behind the scenes here. So there's data 0 to data 7. So these should look very similar and they do. Uh, but what we do see is H, garbage, or O, and then some garbage, and then H. And this garbage, let me step back. So the flash memory is permanently set to chip enable, output enable. So whatever comes on the, on the address bus is going to be output. As we saw earlier, there's propagation delay through the counter chain. So all of the eight bits don't change state at the same time. There's a ripple effect as it walks down the chain. That ripple effect, although we can't see it here because this is a data out, so that ripple effect is changing those addresses as it walks down and creating this block of noise here between the O and the H. Uh, let me say that again and, ma and make sure it's clear. In an earlier bit of video, we looked at the up counter that comes out of the D flip flops, the chain of D flip flops. And remember that the clock comes into the first flip flop, gets divided by two, its output becomes the clock to the second one, its output becomes the clock to the third one, so on and so forth down the chain. However, there's a propagation delay from the clock till the output changing. And that causes the divider chain, if you remember, to create that staircase where this flip flop manages to toggle, then the next one, five and a second slider, then the next one, then the next one. So what that's creating is across eight flip-flops about 40 nanoseconds it takes from the input 
to the output before it becomes stable, someplace around 40 nanoseconds. This is a 90 nanosecond flash memory sitting down here. So what's happening during that 40 nanoseconds is that cascade effect ripples down through uh, the binary up counter that I'm using to drive addresses on the EEPROM is you get this random noise in here and it's just the flash memory seeing address changes quicker than it can respond to we've actually got an interesting little well it's still an O so it becomes unknown becomes an O so you know we could go back and let's do it let's change the decode type to hex and we can see we got the O we can see we got the H we got this 7 F here for a bit of time out of it which is of course bogus let's go back and change the decode type to ASCII so we can actually see the ASCII stream and let's go ahead and scroll through here a bit and see what else we can see oh I'm at the beginning of the am I at the beginning of the stream Actually, let's get the time down a little bit better. Actually, well, looking here is going to be good enough because we can certainly see the. Let's kind of center that, and now we can zoom in, center it again. And we'll just keep zooming in. I should be able to actually pinch and expand as well. Oh, sorry, my voice is going. Anyhow, just what we were looking at earlier. So there it is. So the problem at this point, and this will be the third time I'll talk it through, because of the propagation delay coming through the divider chain and the fact that the outputs going to the new state are offset that creates a set of addresses that are inconsistent between the address for the ASCII O to be output and the address for the ASCII H to be output. And it creates essentially noise and the flash memory tries to react to that. There's a couple ways you could deal with this and we may play with this. Uh, we could use the output enable pin to only uh, enable the output when we know we are clean. Potentially I could use the clock signal coming in to the first divider chain to do that. We'll play with that. For now, because the EEPROM is permanently enabled, chip enabled, output enabled are both grounded, the, the chip is enabled. Anything coming into the address bus attempts to get decoded inside of the flash to output the byte at that memory location. And if these are erratic uh, and doing things we don't want as they transition to their new state, we get garbage out. It's truly a case of garbage in garbage out. And the garbage in as the address cascade works creates garbage through here until we finally get the O out. <clears throat> There's a quick discussion on decoding ASCII, on doing uh, triggering on the bus. Let's go back and take a look. Uh, if we go back to the trigger, remember that we triggered off of a pattern. That pattern is this byte, this bit pattern on the D0 to D7 inputs the logic analyzer, which happens to be a capital R. And we are I'm getting myself lost here. Still trying to figure out the menus. We are decoding the parallel bus right now to an ASCII output. So there's a quick recap. I hope maybe this bit of video made some sense. I hope you're enjoying the mess that gets created uh, as this kind of work happens. Anyhow, I'll be back and we'll look further at refining the circuit. Bye. So an interesting thing I've noticed, just because it's curious, I've got the switches all three to zero, down here all three to zero, selecting bank zero. Bank zero has a 8-bit sine wave lookup table in it. If we actually look at the output on the scope, you can actually see kind of in the bit pattern the shape of a sine wave in there. Uh, that's rather interesting. We're turning off D7 in this case, the lowest clock in there. 
you can see it kind of well, it's along the bottom there but it's interesting that we kind of see the shape of like a half rectified negative sine wave that's actually really kind of interesting and beautiful uh, at some point going forward we'll be feeding that into an R2R network to see how nice a sine wave we can produce of course first we've got to solve the uh, issue with bad data as the addresses cascade with bad data coming out of the EEPROM because that will of course affect the R2R network so we'll be looking at adding a latch here I believe at some point to latch the data when it's clean out of the EEPROM and see what that looks like anyhow I thought I'd share that just because I thought it was rather interesting so in the next video clip there's a rather interesting uh, error on the proto board I wired something very very wrong uh, take a watch see if you can find what I did wrong so I've pretty much come around full circle for this build you've seen many of the stages previously we've got our D flip flops producing the you know divide by eight up counter we've got the pattern ROM in this case the switches are set to all zeros these three so it's outputting a sine wave pattern we come over to he's not down and tighten the there we go we come around to a uh, 74 LS 374 which is an octal D latch the latch enable pin this yellow leads coming off a 7404 inverter up here and what I'm doing is taking the clock signal and inverting it and I'm using an edge of that to latch the output of the flash when I know that the output data is stable uh, the 74LS374 is an edge triggered octal latch so even though we saw all that noise and the propagation delay and everything running through the circuit after this is settled down and the flash memories had time to output clean data we can then latch that data and hold on to it and all of that noise goes away the outputs of the latch then jump over to an R to R network. I'm also tapping off the digital lines up to the scope, the blue traces to capture uh, what's digitally happening. And then finally we have the scope probe here, which you can kind of see, the scope probe here, which comes around to channel one. And so this gets us around to our waveforms. You can see the uh, output uh, the yellow trace is the output of the R to R network producing a sine wave uh, it is AC coupled and it, in this case it doesn't really matter I guess the coupling in this case it is a 0 to 5 volt essentially swing uh, DC it's set to 500 millivolts and we're seeing about one two three and a half volts of swing uh, the blue lines down below are the digital inputs to the R to R network so we can get the time base out a bit here oops wrong control time base out a bit here and look a little closer at the sine wave you can see a little bit of the staircase in there that goes on uh, if we bring the scale the sine wave up you can see really the staircase happening there the uh, yellow dots are where it's stepped to the correct voltage there's a little bit of noise coming through, as you can see. I'll bring that back down to show the sine wave. Let's bring the clock back so we can actually see it. Let's get it centered up off of. Oops. Bring it up into its own region here. I'm going to go ahead and flip all the switches to the noise, the random setting there is random noise uh, it's 256 random 8-bit values uh, I just these were generated on the web on a website I found someplace it's the same 256 course repeating over and over and over if we slow this down a bit you can see the digital nature of the noise uh, Again, the R2R network is summing essentially those eight inputs and producing an analog voltage out that is the summation of them. So during the steady state time, 
it of course holds a steady state as we speed it up these will blend together here and become noise we've got the other patterns I programmed in I'm trying to remember what this pattern was meant to be because it's pretty funny looking not sure what I was going for with that pattern. I'm going to have to go back and look at the ROM code. That looks like a similar pattern. That's actually got a repeating pattern to it. Oops, let's bring the scale down. So that's an interesting analog pattern. Peak with little dips. Let's see if I can get a little cleaner trigger here. Y, John 1. Actually, no, we're triggering off of. Let me set the trigger back to uh, trigger. I was triggering off data 7. That gives us the cleanest look at that sine wave. Let's set the trigger to channel 1. Get down in here where we're triggering. Hopefully off these peaks. No, well, it's certainly an odd little pattern. Come back down to a little sine wave. And of course now we don't have a, a trigger. We'll go back and trigger on D7. solid trigger here. Trigger is set to D7. Just edge. There we go. are just a couple of these are text patterns or, or contain ASCII text I wouldn't expect them to produce anything interesting uh, we can certainly go in as we did earlier and that text and look at the hex values anyhow there's kind of a recap of what we've been through you know it is what it is uh, dividers, pattern memory, a latch to get stable outputs, an inverter to latch at the correct time, and an R to R network to take the digital outputs here and sum them up into a single analog output. Uh, I'll get a, the final schematic drawn up from this. There's been several mistakes I've made <coughs> along the way. I used a 74 LS 373 here Rather than a 374, the 374 latches, the 373 is really more bus buffer. That's why I wasn't getting clean signals. And of course the clock needed to be inverted. Uh, the 374 latches on the positive going edge and I had to invert it from the clock again to get into that clean state that we mentioned. Yeah, there's a little circuit for getting analog and digital stuff on the scope and playing around. I hope you enjoyed and we'll talk soon. Well did you catch the uh, error on the proto board? Uh, it was quite interesting when I noticed it on the 7404 inverter that's sitting above that 374 latch. I didn't have power and ground hooked up. Instead for some reason I had I believe VCC to pin 1 and VSS to pin 8 and then the input and output to the first uh, inverter on it were swapped. Uh, kind of a mystery to me how I was even getting a clock signal through to the latch. Uh, it put that part in some really bizarre mode. Uh, anyhow, it happens. There's a great example of making a mistake on a proto board. So we'll look at some of the ROM bit patterns and the waveform they generate. Of course in yellow is the R2R output.
the ROM data pattern basically is outputting 1, 2, 4, 8, 10, 20, 40, 80, FF, which creates that big spike in the middle, and then walks back down to zero. Uh, and we get that nice, interesting little shaped waveform up there, uh, which is, of course, the R2R output summation of that data stream. So it's exactly what I would have expected to see there. Uh, very nice. Here we're looking at the random bit pattern from the pattern memory. And of course, the waveform being generated by it. Which, surprisingly, is pretty random. So this pattern is actually the, the ASCII text for Rode and Schwartz being output. You can see that the pattern repeats over and over, as it should. It's outputting Rode and Schwartz, Rode and Schwartz, Rode and Schwartz. I could go in here and do, I guess, the decoding and actually look at the decoded data stream, but, but you get the idea. It's just those ASCII characters being output time after time. This is the pattern based on the ASCII text, www.shadowtron.com. And again, it's being repeated over and over. And, and again, in the yellow waveform, you can see the repetition of the pattern. So here we have a look at the final circuit on the proto board. Uh, there's a few things that you may notice. If you look at the 7404, I've actually got VCC hooked to pin 14 and VSS to pin 8. And the clock input and output to the inverter are actually on the correct pins. Uh, if you look a little closer, you'll notice that there's actually some color coding to the scheme here. Uh, if you look at the wires that jump off to the LEDs, you'll notice that they follow a sequence, white, yellow, red, etc. The I've kept the bits the, the, the same, so if I follow you know, A, A0 out of the divider chain into the ROM and then D0 out, etc., those colors tend to be consistent all the way across. It makes hooking things up and troubleshooting a little bit easier. Uh, in the picture, I've actually got a second R2R network hooked up that I've been playing around with, but it's not really important to this video. Uh, the schematic that you've seen a couple pictures of along here has evolved several times. It's been through a number of iterations as I've learned uh, and put things together. Uh, you know, as I said previously, and that schematic is really kind of a, a contrived design to be able to look at things like the propagation delay we saw through the flip-flops to catch the address instability where the addresses are changing uh, with the ROM enabled and the outputs in it become unstable until finally the input addresses are stable and the output becomes stable for the byte selected. Uh, you know those decisions were made intentionally in the design just to give us something to look at on the scope. So my impressions of the Roden short scope so far the RTB 2004 I'm really enjoying using the scope. Uh, it's becoming pretty intuitive as I start to think uh, the way that the designers did when they laid the software out. The touchscreen works pretty well, although the scope itself is fairly lightweight, so I'm a lot of times putting fingers on top to steady it using my thumb to actually select things. Uh, you know, it's a nice scope. I love the screen. That large, bright, high-resolution screen is really nice. Uh, you know, the Rigol scopes I've got are nice scopes as well. This is just a different class, and at the price point, it should be a different class. Anyhow, I'll wrap this up, uh, get this rendered and, and posted. I hope you found something useful in it. If you learned something, let me know. Uh, if there's other mistakes I missed, let me know as well. I'd love to learn from you as well. So anyhow, thanks for watching, and we'll talk soon. Bye. Bye.